That was a spectacular start to what I hope is going to be an excellent meeting. Thank you so much, Lynn. Tons of insight for every one of us here. So that's going to be a hard act to follow, but I have to follow Lynn. Wow. Um, I get to give the opening talk from a scientific perspective. Um, and what I was asked to talk about is classification of neuroendocrine tumors, locations, and functioning versus non-functioning tumors. So I hope in the next few minutes, I'll be able to review for you kind of the broad aspects of this wonderful disease that Lynn has told you about from the patient perspective. And I hope I will debunk a few myths, um, but also hopefully clarify for you what a lot of the doctors and nurses and other healthcare professionals will talk about when you are going through the course of your diagnosis and treatment. So first of all, I'm going to outline the location of neuroendocrine tumors. I'm going to talk a little bit about how they're classified, and there's actually been some interesting progress in the last year, and that's what I'm going to try and focus on. And then I'm going to try and help you with the definitions of what we mean when we say you have a functioning tumor or a non-functioning tumor. What does that mean? Does it correlate with growth or aggressiveness? And then, of course, get you started for the rest of the day because there's lots of great talks to follow. So I'm starting with a picture that some of you, I think, may have seen before if you've been to my talks. It's one of my favorite pictures that shows you that endocrine cells are found in lots of parts of the body. And in most of them, the top left is actually a picture of your lung, what a lung looks like. The next in the middle is the thyroid. The bottom right is a small bowel. And off to the left is an islet of Langerhans from the pancreas. And what you're looking for are the little cells that are brown. And those brown cells are being highlighted by a marker of neuroendocrine cells. And you can see that in all of these organs, there are endocrine cells except for the one at the bottom left where there's not just a single cell there, there's actually a cluster of cells, and that's what we call the islets of Langerhans. And the point I'm trying to make is that endocrine cells of this neuroendocrine family live in lots of parts of the body. Most of the time, they're scattered single cells or a couple of cells here and there, and so the bulk of that tissue is something else. And so, for example, when we talk about pancreatic tumors or lung tumors, when we talk about cancers, most of the time they're from all those other cells. But every once in a while, one of them's going to be made from one of these endocrine cells. Endocrine cells live in many, many different parts of the body. The pituitary, which is a tiny, tiny gland at the bottom of the brain, is a neuroendocrine tissue that's made up almost exclusively of neuroendocrine cells. But it's a tiny little pea-sized gland at the bottom of the brain. And when we talk about brain tumors, we're usually talking about something else. But sometimes we're talking about neuroendocrine tumors, which are pituitary tumors. The thyroid, I've shown you already in a picture, has, it has scattered cells. We call them C cells because they make calcitonin and they're clear histologically, so C cells. The parathyroid gland is another gland that's almost exclusively neuroendocrine, and it's also in the neck next to the thyroid. That's why it's called parathyroid. It makes tumors that are actually very common, but almost, almost, almost never malignant, although there are some malignant ones, and there are neuroendocrine tumors. The thymus in the neck also has endocrine cells. The lung I've shown you, the pancreas, the small bowel, the large bowel, the appendix, even the gonads have neuroendocrine cells. Rarely we'll see primary neuroendocrine tumors of the gonads. And then there's another whole family of cells called paraganglia. And these cells live, as shown in the picture on the right, all the way up and down beside the aorta, running up and down from the base of the brain all the way to our tail, <laughs> what's left of our tail, the back of the bottom of our spine. And these also give rise to neuroendocrine tumors. Interestingly, they're a little bit different because they're actually what we call paraneurons. They're not epithelial cells, which pathologists think of as being kind of um, uh, the, the structural cells that hold our body together. These are more regulatory cells. But fundamentally, they're all members of the same family. They all make the same kinds of biomarkers, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. And they all have the same pattern of difficult diagnosis, 
indolent, I love that word, Lynn, you used it, indolent, which some doctors think means we don't need to worry about them, but slowly progressive tumors and more complicated tumors than most others because not only do they grow like breast cancer or lung cancer, but they also make hormones. And Lynn has already told you a little bit about, and we're gonna hear a lot more today, the effects of those hormones on the way people feel. Now, one of the interesting things that has kind of become to our awareness in the last 20 years is that neuroendocrine tumors, which we used to say were rare, and that's why we use the zebra thing, you know, the CNETs thing of zebra. Zebras are like horses, but much more rare, and you have to recognize them. Um, these tumors are actually increasing in incidence. They're not quite so rare anymore. And I'm starting to wonder if zebra is the right thing we should be using for our symbol because they are increasing in incidence. And you can see almost every single tumor type, lung way up at the top, small intestine, rectum, every kind of tumor that we recognize as neuroendocrine is increasing in incidence. Even the ones that we used to think of not being really important, like pituitary and parathyroid because they don't metastasize, they're far more common than we used to think. In fact, when I went to medical school, people told me I would probably never see a pituitary tumor, especially not something like acromegaly or Cushing's disease. I mean my whole career out of these because they're so common. Thyroid, medullary thyroid carcinoma, increasing in incidence. So I wanna just introduce you to some terminologies and try and help you understand what's happened in the past and where we're going in terms of terminology. These tumors used to be called carcinoid tumors. And in fact, we're called CNETs, which I think is carcinoid neuroendocrine tumor, right? So carcinoid is the term that was used by a fellow named Obendorfer, who's a pathologist like me. Carl Obendorfer was a pathologist in Istanbul, Turkey. He had run away from the Nazis in uh, the early part of 1900s. And he found at autopsy a small tumor in the small bowel which looked like carcinoma, but it hadn't spread. And so he called it carcinoid, the German word, which means carcinoma-like. Because these tumors now do spread, and we know that, many of us have said for many years we shouldn't use that terminology because they're not carcinoma-like, they are carcinomas. So we've stopped using that terminology, but the term carcinoid stuck to the syndrome that some of you have that Lynn kind of described and we'll hear more about that's due to serotonin excess. At one point, pancreatic endocrine tumors were called islet cell tumors, but we've stopped using that terminology for a number of very esoteric pathology reasons. In the early 70s, there was an interesting term, APOID, which stands for amine precursor uptake and decarboxylation, way too much for us, right? Not acceptable anymore. And then we ended up going to neuroendocrine carcinoma, and neuroendocrine carcinoma became something that was difficult to define because some of them didn't metastasize. So we all kind of settled on the idea of net, neuroendocrine tumor. And it's nice, I'm showing you just a picture of a, a net which was given to me by a fellow endocrine pathologist. This happens to be a tennis net. There are lots of nets out there. But this kind of net is something that we've now kind of all come to recognize as a terminology that's acceptable. However, some people still use neuroendocrine carcinoma. Some people use different terminologies in different scenarios. And so in the past year, 2018, the WHO, the World Health Organization, brought together a group of experts in this disease from different parts of the world and different parts of the body. And by that I mean lung pathologists, GI pathologists, pancreas pathologists, and endocrine pathologists who see all of this. And we came to the agreement that these neuroendocrine tumors should be called neoplasms as an overarching term. Neoplasia means unrestricted growth, which is the definition of most cancers and, and in any site in the body. And we agreed that these tumors can arise at almost any site of the body, that there are two families, the epithelial ones that I told you about in my first slide where I had the epithelial tissues on one side and the paraneuronal ones on the other side. And we recognize that all these tumors express a bunch of proteins that are similar to all of them. And we wanted to use this concept of neuroendocrine neoplasia as an overarching scene that includes all the tumors, but we would change the definitions to be very clear that neuroendocrine tumors, NETs, are from a category of very well-differentiated tumor cells 
that make hormones and still look very classifiable as neuroendocrine. And we would separate out from those the concept of neuroendocrine carcinomas, which we restrict for use in a family of tumors that's actually very different. These are usually other tumors that can arise in uh, tissues like lung and pancreas and bowel, but they behave much more like the regular carcinomas. They just happen to show some neuroendocrine features, and we have come to recognize that these are completely different in terms of the molecular changes that cause them, familial predispositions, which are completely different, and all of the other things that we as doctors need to think about, like diagnosis and treatment. So those are neuroendocrine carcinomas, and NETs now encompass the entire family of tumors we're going to talk about today. And we've come to recognize that proliferation rates, G1, G2, G3, which you'll hear about in a few minutes, these all apply to NETs. It used to be thought that as soon as a tumor became very proliferative, it became a neuroendocrine carcinoma. We now know that's not true. We look at biomarkers of differentiation, and as a pathologist, I think these are really important because, first of all, they help me to recognize what is the tumor so I ensure you get the right diagnosis. But they also provide us with biomarkers for clinicians who are going to be following you as a patient. And I'll talk a little bit about th some of those, but really that talk is going to be done by Dr. Izad, who's going to talk about the biochemistry because it's the biomarkers made by these tumor cells that we use to follow up patients and monitor for progression or, if we think you're cured, to monitor you for any potential recurrence. As a pathologist, I help the clinicians by de defining how bad is this tumor. Is it nicely encompassed and the surgeon could get it all out, or is this an infiltrative tumor that is getting through its capsule and around nerves and into blood vessels and more likely to have spread at the time of diagnosis? And of course, we want to know how fast this tumor is going to grow because that's going to help the clinicians to monitor both your progress but also decide what is the right treatment for you. And we, for that, we look for things like mitoses. Mitoses are dividing tumor cells or KI-67 labeling. You're all going to hear about that. And Lynn mentioned that her KI-67 proliferation index wasn't quite right for some treatment. That's what the pathologist has to define. Why do we do all this? Well, we do it because we know it's useful. And this is an old graph based on an old classification system, but it doesn't really matter because the principles are the same. If you've got a slowly growing tumor with few mitoses, a low KI-67 labeling index, your prognosis is going to be the top one. You're going to do much better. If you've got a very aggressive tumor, you're going to be on the left curve. Now, you're a patient, you're, not, you're very smart people. The curves are different, but they're not good. None of them is good. We don't really want any of these, but it's helpful to at least know where we're going to be on that, on that curve. I want to just make a couple of more comments about the concept now of the distinction between neuroendocrine tumors and neuroendocrine carcinomas. And I think this is really important, and even many doctors don't understand this. These tumors all have neuroendocrine biomarkers. And unfortunately, many people classify them all the same way. But they're two completely different categories of tumors. First of all, they have different degrees of biological aggressiveness. The neuroendocrine carcinomas are much more aggressive than NETs. Most importantly, they have completely different responses to medical therapies. Neuroendocrine carcinomas don't express, for example, somatostatin receptors at a very high level. And so when we talk about using somatostatin drugs or peptide receptor radiotherapy, it's not going to work for those tumors because they don't express the receptors to take up the drug or the, uh, the um, radioactive substance. These tumors have different risk factors and completely different hereditary predispositions. We've come to recognize that neuroendocrine tumors are very commonly familial, but not neuroendocrine carcinomas. They have different relationships to other non-neuroendocrine neoplasia. For example, in the lung, small cell carcinoma is actually a neuroendocrine carcinoma. It's very aggressive, and we know that it's induced by smoking. That's not the same as a neuroendocrine tumor that has nothing to do with smoking and lots to do with family history. And then, of course, there are different genetic alterations, which I've listed on the slide for any doctors in the audience, but for patients, the important thing to know is that they're completely different. 
Now, I was asked to mention the difference between functioning and non-functioning neuroendocrine tumors. And as I said earlier on, the important difference between these tumors and other tumors is that they make hormones, and hormones wreak havoc on people in ways that structural disease does not. Functioning tumors are those that give rise to signs and symptoms of hormone excess, and neuroendocrine tumors can make lots and lots of hormones. And this is a really complicated chart. You don't need to memorize it, believe me, and if you want to go back and look at it when you look at the recording, your tumor might be listed in here. We know that every endocrine tissue has many different endocrine cells, and each cell type makes a different hormone, and there are at least 30 or 40 peptide hormones that we know can be made by these tumors, and each one has different clinical symptoms. What's important to know is the distinction between a functioning tumor, which some of you may know you have and are being followed for a hormone excess syndrome, versus what is often called a non-functioning tumor. Now, this is supposedly one that doesn't give rise to signs or symptoms of hormone excess if you're defining it as a clinical terminology. And I emphasize that clinically, this depends on the sensitivity of the patient and the clinician. If you're doing it by biochemical assessment, you're measuring the hormones in the blood. And some tumors actually make hormones, but they're not secreted in sufficient quantities to be measured at every time of the day in the blood. The pathology definition for a non-functioning tumor is that it's negative for all hormones. Now, I'm going to tell you a story. In our lab at UHN, for many years, we measured lots of hormones. In many other labs, in many different hospitals, including some very well-known centers of excellence, they measure three or four hormones by pathology. And if those are negative, they call it non-functioning. So, I would argue that this definition is a very soft and intangible one because it depends on what you're measuring. And I also want to say that silent endocrine tumors or non-functioning tumors are not always silent. Now, we can use the analogy here. We're talking about silence. We can use the analogy of noise. Somebody who's shouting, everybody can hear them. Somebody who's whispering may not be heard, and especially if they're in an audience of deaf people. Clinicians have very different sensitivities to what they consider functioning tumors. And sometimes, and I've seen many patients frustrated by this, they're complaining that they've got symptoms, they're not feeling well, the clinician says, I've measured your 5-HIA and it's normal, you're crazy, go away. They may not say the last part. And they're missing something else, okay? So, Here's just a, an old picture, and I bring this up to emphasize that we take a very long time to learn lessons. I'm showing you a picture from a book which I was very fortunate to be involved in. Back in 1984, I was still a trainee, and I went to a conference in Sweden. And by the way, the Swedish have been on to neuroendocrine tumors for a very long time, way ahead of the rest of us. And back in 1984, they offered this map of the distribution of endocrine hormones in the gut and their localization in different parts of the gut. And I can tell you that to this day, there isn't a single lab that measures all of these hormones or stains for all of these hormones in neuroendocrine tumors of the gut. But they're there. So how silent are they? We may just not be listening. The pancreas. The pancreas also has four different cell types. And we at least should measure at least the four different hormones that are being made by those tumors. In fact, there are more because the four, glucagon, insulin, somatostatin, and pancreatic polypeptide, we now know that those are pancreatic hormones and we usually stain them in good centers of excellence. But the, the others listed here are also often made by neuroendocrine tumors because they're part of the same family as the ones in the gut and those are all gut hormones. And each of these gives rise to a clinical syndrome, whether it's diabetes and mellitus and a rash from a glucagonoma or hypoglycemia from insulin excess, or serotonin giving the carcinoid syndrome, which we usually associate with the small bowel. All of these can be made by pancreatic endocrine tumors. This is the classic small bowel neuroendocrine tumor, which does make serotonin. And of course, if you have one of these, then 5-HIAA urinary measurements is the right test to be doing. But if you have a tumor that's making pancreatic polypeptide, 
you don't want to measure five HIAs and collect that urine for 24 hours so many times over and over. It's not pleasant. And then, of course, our rectal nets that can make many different hormones as well. We need to be aware of these distinctions and understand what we mean. And I would love the day for functioning and non-functioning to go away and instead talk about this is an endocrine tumor made of X cell type that makes Y hormone and use the right measurements for those. One more picture just to show you again. As a pathologist, it's so easy for me to stain these tumors up and identify exactly what they are making and what they're not making so I can help guide my clinicians to measure the right thing and understand their patient's symptoms, not tell them, eh, you're normal and this is all in your head. So my job today was to introduce you to neuroendocrine tumors, to talk a little bit about the tumor types. I mentioned tumor grading based on proliferation. Tumor staging I didn't talk about, but I think Lynn actually mentioned her tumor stage. Tumor staging is how far has the tumor progressed when we diagnose it. Is it localized still in its home, or has it gotten out and spread to other parts of the body? I've talked a little bit about hormones and chromogranin as surveillance biomarkers. I've mentioned the concept of genetic predisposition. I want to emphasize, although I don't have time to talk about it today, how important it is that we're starting to recognize that nets are not just a disease of the patient, but they can affect their whole family, not just because of the patient's problems, but because these tend to be very frequently genetically inherited. <laughs>